I don't want you to think that I simply sat down and typed this from top to bottom. In fact, you rarely ever type anything in R. You'll almost always be writing a script, which is just a text file. Uh, the, the GUI interface provides a simple text editor. I find it, it's actually quite a nice text editor. It doesn't do anything fancy, but it does all the things uh, you expect it to. And what you'll typically do is take somebody else's script or copy little bits of R code from somebody else and cobble them together into a script. And then you'll, as I'll demonstrate in a moment, you'll run this script and errors will happen and things will go wrong and nothing will work. And then you go back and change things and you iterate and iterate until you get it right. I iterated several times and I hope I've got it right, but it will be instructive if there's an error along the way. I've already um, set my working directory with the pull down menu, uh, but here's how you could do it with the command. Uh, the next thing I want to do or need to do is load some libraries. I know that there is a special software package called QTL that I want to use, and there's another package that I want to use called ggplot. As I just told you, there's many ways to do everything in R, and there is a default graphics package that was, would be automatically loaded into my environment, and I'll use a little bit of it, but I really like ggplot, and I'm going to show you a little bit of it today. And if you get interested in ggplot, there's a, a nice little website. I've given you the URL so you can go, go look it up. One of the challenges that you might have loading the script is you'll find that ggplot is actually not on your computer. And if you need to load something on your computer, you can go to the package installer. I recommend this. It's the simplest way to install packages. Uh, and it'll work a little differently on the PC or the Mac. Uh, and I'm not going to demonstrate it. As I said, you rarely ever type anything directly into the R window. You type it into your script. And the way that I like to work is I'll, I will highlight the text. And you can't see, but I'm, I'm holding the command key and hitting return. And I've loaded the QTL library with no problem. And I've loaded the ggplot library and there's all this red stuff. Oh, <laughs> how worried should I be? Well, if it says error, I should be really worried. But here it just says warning. And it's telling me that ggplot was built under a different version of R than the one I have installed on my computer, which is just a little way to say expect trouble. But I'm bold. On we go. Uh, now we're going to get down to QTL mapping. The first thing I need to do is get my QTL data. And I have already created a file. It's called btbrxb6.csv that has the QTL data in the CSV format. I've opened it up and taken a peek and seen that the genotypes are coded as BB, BR, and RR for homozygous B6, heterozygous, and homozygous BTBR. And I like to tell it, tell RQTL that the allele symbols are B and R. This just makes the plots come out nicer later on. And you'll see some examples of uh, how this comes about. Now, when I constructed this command, I didn't know what to type. I know there's a function called read.cross in RQTL. There are several ways that I, I can find out. And one way is to type question mark read.cross. And it gives me a, a pretty detailed description of the syntax of this command. And uh, I can read through this. And at the bottom, there should be some examples. And uh, this is a long one. <laughs> but you can see that um, there's some help available there. In fact, I may have forgotten and I didn't even know. I know there's a way to read the data in, but I don't remember uh, what the commands are. And there's a nice help window that works uh, via the um, HTML. I typically go to Packages. I'll go down to the QTL package and I can see all the commands that are in the QTL package. And um, as I go scrolling through them all, reading them one by one, eventually I stumble across read.cross, which says read data for a QTL experiment. 
this sounds like what I need and there is again the, the same help file. So two different ways to get at uh, help. Having read that and understood it, I'm able to write a command uh, to read the data. It takes a moment to run. It's a big data set. And it tells me some summary information, which is comforting. There are 519 individuals, lots of markers, 59 phenotypes. It's an F2 cross. And then I typed ls just to see what was in my environment, which was previously empty. But now I have something in my environment called bxr. Now, my personal style is to make the names of my data objects short and perhaps cryptic, but if I want to know what anything in my environment is, a good first attempt is to try the summary function. Summary looks to see what kind of object it's reading, and then it writes an appropriate summary. In this case, it tells me that BXR is an F2 intercross with 519 individuals, 59 phenotypes. There's some missing data, I can tell, but it's mostly there. There are 20 chromosomes, 19 autosomes, and the X with, as I said, lots of markers, and the marker data types, uh, genotypes are mostly complete, 99.4%. and I see that the BB, BR, and RR genotypes are present at about 25, 50, and 25 percent, which is what I expect in an F2 intercross. So I feel pretty good that everything got read in the right way. If you made some kind of mistake reading things in, you, you may see funny uh, reports that don't, it, you always have to stop and ask, does it make sense? I still want to know more about this object BXR though because the summary just gives me a summary of it but I really want to know that some details of it. Uh, the class function will tell me uh, what kind of object it is. It's an F2 cross object. Well, um, so far that's not very informative. So I'm going to try the names command. It doesn't always work but in this case it does and it tells me that BXR has two named components, the geno component and the pheno component. And so now I can use this dollar sign operator to zoom in on the, the components. First I'm going to look at the geno component and I can see that that's a list. Well, that's helpful. You can learn what a list is. I'm not going to, uh, to go on about it today, but a list is what it says. It's a list of in this case 20 things and those 20 things have names 1, 2, 3, 4 through X which are rather suggestive of chromosome names. So I'm guessing that the genotype data are stored in these list elements that have names uh, that correspond to chromosomes and I could look under the hood further and try to see what's in these elements and you can do that. I'll, I'll leave it up to you and you may find that it's challenging um, but there's a lot of information stashed away underneath the hood there. What I'm really interested in at the moment though are the phenotypes. And I can see that the phenotypes are stored in something called the data frame. A data frame is just a rectangle of data and every row in a data frame is, is an individual unit, in this case a mouse, and every column in a data frame is a variable. And if I ask for the names of a data frame I get in this case a fairly lengthy list of 59 different things that are all stashed away in that data frame. And some of them have rather long names. And since I may have to type some of those names in the future, I've decided um, that I really don't need them all and I really want to give them shorter names. So here's a rather lengthy piece of code that will do a couple of things for me. First it's going to get rid of some of the columns. And I want you to notice this bracket notation. I'm going to keep all the rows, comma. And then I'm going to subtract some of the columns. I'm going to subtract columns 2 to 5, 8 to 18, and a bunch of others. I just kind of went through the data. I understand it pretty well, so I know what I don't want. And I just got rid of those. But I also want to shorten up the names, but I don't want to throw away the long names. So I've copied the names into a, a variable called long pheno names. And then I'm going to replace the names. And I want you to notice this syntax, which is 
uh, assignment by indirection, if you would. It, it, I'm telling that I'm telling R to assign the names of this data frame to this new list of names, and I'm just going to do that. Um, and then I'm going to just check to see that my names are now what I think they should be. And you see that I've listed 38 rows, so I've reduced my data set down to 38. My first variable is the mouse number, my second is the sex, the third is the paternal grandmother, and then there are these funny things, agouti, tuft, and some of them make sense, weight dot four weeks. Uh, call for cholesterol and I can see the short name and the long name and everything lines up so I'm, I'm quite happy that I did it right. I'll tell you that I didn't do it right on the first try and putting this little sanity check in my script was a, an important uh, critical move. Uh, there's another way to look at the structure of an R object. I, I don't, I, I find it often confusing but you should know about the str command and in this case, the str command is, is actually pretty friendly. It tells me that the phenotype data uh, gives me a list of all the elements, the named elements. It tells me whether they're factors or numerical. And we'll come to, uh, come to that in a moment. But, um, you know, gives me examples of what's in every, every one of those columns. And I know that one of my factors in the data is sex. And here's a little example of a command called table. Um, it makes a little table of the variable sex. And I want you to no notice how I referred to it. Table of BXR dollar. So I'm grabbing the pheno component of BXR. And then I'm grabbing the sex component of pheno. So that dollar operator allows me to go in and grab the data that's associated with a named object. And it's one of many ways to get at the elements in BXR. So I see there are 244 females, 275 males. Uh, I'm going to look at PGM. And what I'm going to learn is that all 519 uh, mice have the same paternal grandmother, which means the cross was done in one direction. It was done in actually B6 by BTBR, uh, so B6 is the mom. Um, I also wonder what this agouti thing is. I actually know what it is. It's, it's a coat color, and the mice are either black or tan, and 135 of them were black, and 375 of them were tan. And I happen to know that black is a recessive coat color allele, so about one quarter of the mice should be black, and if you do the arithmetic, Actually, if you do the arithmetic, 135 divided by 135 plus 375, you'll see that about one quarter of the animals are black. Very nice. I might wonder how those uh, break out by sex, and the table command can take two arguments, and I can see that different uh, numbers of males and females are black and tan. And I was a little puzzled when I saw that. I thought, well, that looks a little skewed. So I actually, just for my own education here, I did this chi-square test. And the p-value is 0.1, so it's not significant. But yeah, you know, it's a little bit skewed. But I don't think there's anything really weird going on. It's just the way the coat colors came out in this cross. So that's a little bit of a look at the discrete uh, variables in my data frame. And uh, I'm also just going to take a quick peek at the genetic map. And there it is. And I, I would recommend when you work with this data set that you don't try to estimate the genetic map, that you don't try to draw the RF plot. And the reason is there are over 2,000 markers. And when RQTL was written, it was unheard of to have over 200 markers. And the software will try to create a map and it will, um, if it doesn't crash your computer, take a very, very long time. The map here is good. You can see that there are markers all over the genome. They're not very uniformly distributed. There are large gaps. These gaps could represent uh, places in the genome where it just wasn't possible to place markers um, or the markers weren't available uh, for whatever reason. 
Uh, this is where they are. I'm going to close that window 